Our next speaker is Cam McKellar. Cam farms 3,100 acres on the Liverpool Plains, 2,000 of which is furrow irrigated, growing processing corns, sorghum and summer legumes. In winter, durum wheat and chickpeas are grown, as well as running a cattle trading enterprise. Just because he wasn't busy enough, he has just purchased another 2,300 acres, 20 kilometres south of his current property to diversify into more cattle production. Cam is also an Aeromaster compost turner owner, producing on-farm compost from local waste residues. Cam was awarded a Nuffield Scholarship in 1992 and in the last two years was equal winner of Greening Initiatives in Agriculture and Carbon, Co Co Carbon Cocky of the Year for Outstanding Leadership. He's also a contributor to the Soils for Life initiative as one of the 19 case studies. Uh, I'd like to welcome Cam. This is just so good that I see we're going to have some science and we're going to have farmer perspective. And mind you, most of our farmers and, and whatever, you know, have learnt this science. And this is why the more you learn, the more you're going to know. So I'd like to introduce Cam and thank him very much for coming. Thank you, Ronald. Uh, am I on? Am I on? Okay, yeah. Sideways and yeah. then bent arrow. Right, thank you. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank, firstly, thank you, Bill and Rhonda, for inviting me to talk. And um, hopefully I can teach you in 30 minutes what's taken our family 50 years to experience. And you don't make some of the mistakes that, uh, that we've made along the way. But firstly, I just I love asking a question before I start. And I want a hands-up response. Um, Who's the most important person in the world? And I don't want any Julies or Tonys or... Uh, yeah, yeah. Who, who's the most important person in the world? And not yourself either. No, not yourself, no. Anybody want to have a guess? I'll help you out. The most important person in the world is the person who provides your next meal. And that's half the people sitting in this room. And I think if we can get that word out to the rest of the other people, uh, we might actually be a little bit more appreciated for what we, we try and do, and that is to, um, to feed the world with good nutritional food. So that's, I think, the guts of what this whole couple of three days is about, is, is nutritional food production. Um, okay, so... Um, that's a sunflower on the right. I don't know what the other thing is on the left, but that's all right. So, oh no, hang on, how do we do this? Other way. I oh, know. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, we're at Spring Ridge, um, which is sort of 100k southwest of Tamworth, west of Corindai. Um, my old man bought that farm in 1962, so we're actually celebrating our 50 years of, of being there um, this year. So I want to take you through the, uh, the um, ups and downs of that 50 years very quickly. So there's a happy little sunflower, that's all good. Um, Oh, gee whiz. That's a bit hard to see, isn't it? Okay, so um, as I just said, we, we bought the farm in, in 1962. It was basically a, um, uh, a virgin grass, plains grass block. It, it had not been farmed. We're guessing, we don't really know, that the soil organic matter was about 3%. Um, we had meter long worms on it when, when uh, we first started to break it up. I'll tell you about that a little more in a minute. And, and there was no fertiliser used. So um, I'm going to talk about sort of the four Fs of, of what, what's going on. So we were, we were f f oh, pardon me, fertile when we first started off, and then we were f fatigued. Ron, get your hand off that dump button. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, that was when, you know, from the mid '70s through the '90s, and then we sort of spent um, 10 or 12 years trying to fix it, and now I think we're firing. So th that's about where we're up to. Um, the, uh, the fertile part of it, look, it was, it was as I said, 3% organic matter um, because of that long period, and God knows how long the period was, of, of um, just native plains grass, um, the, the swelling cracking of the black soils that just kept on recy recycling themselves, self-mulching black soils. Um, so when it was first broken up in about the mid-60s, the old man was going to grow loosen and, and fat lambs. Uh, 65 droughts sort of buggered all those thoughts. And then in about mid, 
66 or 7, he put in um, an exploratory bore, found good irrigation water, um, and unfortunately some have never been the same since. So um, we went from, from basically a dryland farm to an irrigation farm in the next uh, 10 years. But in, in doing that, um, we started to grow corn and we didn't really need any fertiliser because of the, the built up fertility of the soil over the last you know, eons. Although um, corn's a, a very high usage crop and best management practice at the time, um, I, I, there's two words in agriculture I don't like, best management practice and sustainability. So I'll explain that later. But best management practice at the time said we needed anhydrous ammonia. So anhydrous ammonia is um, a really nasty uh, nitrogen source. What was left of the organic matter that hadn't broken down was basically nuked off with the, with the use of the NH4. Um, and what we found was that every year we were turning the knob up on the gas tank because our, our crops weren't responding to the fertiliser as they did the year previously. So that basically just nuked all our meat along earthworms. Our man used to whinge and bitch about when he'd cultivate the fields in, in, the, in the middle of the 60s that um, he'd have to clean the shanks on the scarify down once or twice a day because they'd choke the, the tines up. Now I've, ne I've never seen one of these big meat along worms so um, that's my aim in life is to get some of them back on the farm. So, you know, between the mid-70s, everything just got ramped up, the irrigation developed. And what we didn't notice was that the soil was just starting to say, you know, get a bit tired of this. So this is when we started to see the decline of the soil. Um, and it was, you know, disease was becoming more prevalent. Insects were giving us a workout and we just kept on winding the whole job up. You know, you'd, you'd squirt on a bit more um, artificial fertiliser and you'd nuke it with something else to kill the grubs. And before we knew where we were, we were on this high input treadmill that we couldn't bloody well get off. And the only people who were making any, any money out of our business was you know, the bank manager, the seed man, the furt man, the chemical man and the fuel man. And we were going, you know, we're just working for them basically. So. In 92, I did an uphill scholarship, as Rhonda said, um, which allowed me to go overseas for six months. I opened my eyes to a whole new world. I came back and thought, right, we're going to hook right into this and ramp the whole job up even more. That was probably, a, looking back on it, was a disaster because that just meant that we got deeper in the doo-doo. And by 95, 98, we were just, it just wasn't happening anymore. And I suppose what I'm trying to say is because of the irrigation, we're ramping, we're, we're producing more grain per acre per year than you would in a dryland situation. So therefore, I think we've ex exacerbated the problems that a normal dryland farmer might get over a longer period of time. If that makes sense, I'm, I'm just putting the warning bells up. You know, you might think that you've got really good land now, but in 30 years' time, you're in the same situation as we were in that 10-year period. If that makes sense. So um, it, it just. Late 90s was a real, um, well, it, it, was a, it was either time to change or get out, basically. And we were that far from saying, well, bugger this, and uh, we were going to go. So it, it took, um, it took a major mind shift to change where we went. So we sort of, I'm sorry about that black writing. Um, just bear with me. So that, that, that's obviously not farming country, but that's, that's what our black soil felt like, if you know what I mean. This was actually a photo taken not far from us during the drought, and that's um, that state forest um, planted monoculture, eucalypt monoculture, and look at it, it's bloody. I, I sat in there for 20 minutes one day, just, just sitting, and there was no life whatsoever. Absolutely dead, you know, it was just, it was incredible. So, you know, to get through that fatigue bit, it all you know, started with the irrigation, there's the NH4, the decline began. Um, the insecticides, herbicides, fertiliser was the main culprit and the loss of the organic matter. So that sort of moved on to about, um, where are we, say, late 90s. So in the fixing st stage, uh, it started off 
with a holistic management course that Bruce Ward, who unfortunately is no longer with us, who had a, a great impact on Australian agriculture, will be sadly missed. And um, having done his course in 2000, it led me on to a whole heap of other things. Um, I've probably done every course that's ever been put on, but um, I might have jumped the gun here a bit. But now we've got stuff in our soil um, that, that's, that's happening. Like this little guy here and Carolyn, you might be, have to help me out here with names because I can't pronounce them. That's my predatory mind. Yeah. <laughs> this guy here is, isn't he? Uh, you'll see on my side, this corner. Him? Yeah, well, that's not my photo, though. <laughs> <laughs> or, or th these three guys here or, all came out of our soil. He, he, he's, a, he's a predatory wasp of some description. And these guys are all less than half a mil. So you can, you can see them in the microscope, but you can't really see them in the native, with the naked eye. Um, this is through a project that's being done by um, a, a mob in, in UNA and Armada. But I just think this bottom right-hand corner is just a cool photo. I mean, look at that proboscis, if that's the word, into this rooster here. I mean, that's, that's going on down there. It's just, there's just war down there. So that's why you've got to get this job sorted. It, it's, um, it's just the whole guts of, of the biological system. So um, uh, where were we? So if, if, if I knew what I knew, let's say in about you know, the early, oh, well, I came home from school about 77 or 78, if I knew then that insects, weeds, pests and disease were not a lack of um, insecticides, pesticides or fungicides, but a lack of minerals and nutrition, I'd be where I think we're going to be in 2040. You know, we just could have, just could have jumped the, the whole devastation 30 year period and um, it, it, would have been, it would have been really interesting to know where these black soils on the Liverpool Plains could have been if it wasn't for chemical agriculture. So, and it's going to take us, I reckon, another 20 years to get it really back to where we were and then try and develop them even further. So, um, um, to, to tell you of some of the practice that we've been using in the last 10 or 12 years, um, we, we've used some biodynamic practices um, this guy, you can see the, the, the water coming out here on either side of the, the spray rig. That's uh, for the BD500, so that's uh, a, a, um, a soil prep. And then I don't know whether you can see under the A there, there's, there's, a, there's a, a squirter there that actually squirts right up in the air. And it's for the 501 and it's an atmospheric spray. So these are just things that, that are not... Um, they're not rocket science. Don't ask me to quantify them. That's, that can be Hugh Lovell's job later on. But th they work. It's as simple as that. Um, so that's a flow form that we use to energise anything before we put it out. So the water just basically comes out of the tank, up the top and down through the, the, the bowls. And it, it just mixes it. And to show you how that works, you see the vortexing of the water, and that just softens and energises the water. So we use this not only for our BD preps, but if we have to put a little bit of, of N on a crop or something like that, we'll actually put uh, maybe, well, say, say the equivalent of 15 to 20 kilos of, of nitrogen per hectare. We'll run that through the flow form, we'll put in a bit of humic acid, and just run it for, for um, the hour, hour and a quarter, and it takes the burn out of the the nitrogen and it just makes it the plant grab it and go and I think we're probably getting for let's say if if we're putting 20 kilos on I reckon we're probably getting 50 kilos worth of kick if, if you were to do it in a in a conventional sense um, we've also got two field broadcasters up and Hugh might I don't know whether you're going to delve into that here will you okay well <laughs> yeah uh, so we, we've got two of these up. Hugh, Hugh um, puts those in and, and they just subtly emit all, all the BD um, preps all day every day plus a few other things uh, uh, that we've got in there with, with my intent on what I want to happen with the farm as well. And I think your intent, what you think is what you get and if you, if you, you know, think negatively all the time, sure as eggs it'll happen. If you think positively all the time, 
um, it'll sort of go with you occasionally. Um, there, there's soil fungi, you can, see, you can see strands coming off whatever that is there. Um, you know, 10 years ago we didn't even have that uh, and it doesn't take long to get it back. <coughs> uh, and that was actually uh, a response from cattle. So we use cattle um, as stubble digesters. Unfortunately, or fortunately, the last couple of years, I, I like trading skinny cows. There hasn't been any bloody skinny cows about, and they've all been too dear. However, if it doesn't rain, the next fortnight might be a different story. Um, I've got my acres and hectares bugged up here, but this particular field here was a 100 acre field. We had 320 uh, first calf heifers in that that were on adjustment. Uh, they were getting 1.25 acres a day and we were moving them daily. So you can see this is where they were yesterday in this bottom bit here. This is where they were today and in, well in fact they were going to move up here but, but that's what it was, um, what, that's what they're going into. This was a, an irrigated crop of sorghum. It was, um, it went about three tonne of the acre. Um, we did not spray it out with Roundup. I would rather leave the sorghum and take it off you know, a week or so later when it dries down naturally because if you spray it out, the cattle just won't eat it. They just don't like it at all. Um, so what we effectively achieved was in 80 days, we reduced all that stubble, put it on the ground, added the manure, so you're getting you know, about six tonne of wet manure per acre per day. Um, we saved ourselves two sprays of Roundup because we didn't nuke it in the in, uh, prior harvest and we didn't spray it um, um, after harvest because these cows were in for 80 days and basically cleaned it all up. Yes, we did go in after 80 days and we planted chickpeas and, and just cleaned the whole lot up. So the, the chickpeas went in straight into that, that stubble. The interesting thing was um, I had aphids come into this crop just oh, probably you know, when the sorghum was green in the head. Ran the agronomist and said, quick, get your butt out here, we've got aphids in the sorghum. He said, I can't get there till uh, 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. I said, that's fine. Out he came 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Where's the aphids? Well, pff, they were here yesterday. My next door neighbour had a crop diagonally opposite. Um, absolutely full of aphids. Said, what's going on here? Pulled out a bricks meter, bricked our sorghum, bricked his sorghum. Ours was bricksing 14, his was bricksing 6. Aphids said, don't like your sorghum, I'm going to his. So four days later they had the aeroplane over it and we didn't. Simply because our bricks readings were higher. So, and you know, they're the pure chemical and, and, and fur. So it's, it's really interesting when you see that a pretty little insect that big that must have a brain, pff, however big, can tell the difference between something that's good and something that's rubbish. Because in, uh, insects are nature's garbage collectors, so they go on to the, the other stuff to, to clean it up. So by putting the cattle through, not only did we save two sprays of Roundup, we basically put another 180 bucks of, of value on that crop because they were adjustment cattle at five bucks a week. Um, and I forget what we got for that sorghum, but, it, but 180 bucks is probably another tonne of grain per acre. Plus we've got the manure um, for free. So it wasn't a bad gig. And it's not that hard to do. Um, we use all temporary fencing. We can put in and pull out two, 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 I can't speak, two kilometres of fence in about half an hour with two bikes. We just use a single hot wire. Um, we do it on our irrigation um, rows that are all about a thousand metres long. And if you could imagine, I'd, I'd have a fence down that wall there. I'm just using this as an example. A fence down there, a fence down there, and a fence down there. And the water trough might be down this bottom corner. So as we just put hot tapes across here for the, to get your acre and a quarter a day and then we're moving back into this bay here and start again. As we're doing that, we just pull this fence out here, hook it up to the ute like that, so just pull the pin locks out of the steelies, throw the steelies in the ute, hook the wire up here, just drive him out and around and back down here and bang him back in and there you go. Our, our stays are just a, just a steely with a three, so there's a one and a half steelies in it, it's a triangular 
formation. Bit of pipe there to put a steely through to hang him up. And that's just a bit of two inch pipe with a half a link welded on it there that you can put in there. The trough's just a piece of pipe. You can see that was a round pipe. We cut that bit out there, put him on the end, put a bung in it, two inch um, cam lock fitting there, high flow um, float, and we've got skids on it so you can drag it with you. It'll pick it up the front end loader and put it wherever you want. And the cows won't bugger that. So it's not, not that difficult. So that's one system we use, and then we make our own compost. Now that has got to be the most photographed tractor in the world. <laughs> Rhonda and I just having a little private joke here, because Rhonda used to have that in all her older um, presentations. I think Hugh, you've got that tractor as well in one of your presentations. <laughs> it still is a great tractor. We bought this from Bill and Rhonda three and a half, nearly four years ago now. So. Um, I've got a guy on full time and that's all he do does is, is make compost. We try and get our products as locally as, and as cheap as possible. So we source uh, manure from the Corona feedlot which is just down the road, which I've got to buy in. Um, we source chopped up wheat straw and, and chicken manure from not that far away but I get that for freight because it's a waste product to them and it's, no, it's not enough oomph in it to use as fertiliser. So I get that for freight. I get sawdust out of the ALEX centre in Tamworth um, for freight. I get all the rotten grain and sweepings and dust and what have you out of Grain Corp. They'll deliver that for me for nothing. So oh, wet hay, I, you know, I've done a bit of bartering with, with wet hay. I might, well, I've picked up 600 bales of oat and hay here six or eight months ago and I just swapped him a load of compost. You know, it's just, so whatever we can, we can get, is good. So uh, we try and make 2,000 or 2,500 tonne a year and um, we sell a little bit but at this stage all well, the majority goes back on the farm. I think that's my next job is to, to try and sell a bit just to try and cover compost boys we call him and yeah. <laughs> um, so that's it from the from a sort of a from an aerial view, um, it's, it's a 10 acre pad, so 200 or 4 hectares, so 200 metres by 200 metres. So we just uh, lay, lay the rows of straw out, then he'll break them up, put the turner through it, wet it, get it to the right consistency, then we'll, we'll add our um, recipe, whatever that may be. So I know the C to N ratio on all of our inputs. That goes into a computer program via Rhonda's recipe up it pops and that's what goes on to the brew. It takes roughly 10 to 12 weeks to go from um, uh, the, the, the broken down stage of, of the straw to a, a stable humified compost. The tarps you can see there um, are Gore-Tex, so they actually, they're waterproof but they'll allow it to breathe. Um, Heath's job every morning is to check the moisture, the CO2 and the temperature and if any of those three parameters aren't where they're meant to be, he'll turn it to, to oxygenate it or add moisture or, or whatever. So he's got graphs on every row and he can tell you what's in it and da 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 da. So um, that's how we do the compost. Um, oh, well I think I I'll give you a bit of a laugh. Here's my new jackaroo getting a lecture. <laughs> uh, say what you will, um, Tony Abbott's been to the farm twice now and was very responsive to what we're trying to do. So obviously, he, actually, I just looked at that photo probably. I am giving him a lecture, aren't I? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, <coughs> This was sort of when the carbon tax was all being debated probably uh, 12 months ago. Um, and he had a pretty good handle on the whole deal, what we're trying to do. So I, I wouldn't hold your breath, but if, if there is a change in government, I think that we may get a bit of understanding of what's going on in the carbon debate, maybe, possibly. Has Rinsa been there? Has, has Rinsa been there? No. No. Now, that, see, see the root on the right hand side here, how it's just bare and denuded of anything? 
Whereas this route has, I'll pinch Rhonda's phrase here, has dreadlocks on it. Um, that was, we had a quick storm on the compost pad. It washed down across the road and into a piece of pasture just on the other side of the road. And there was a little sort of little rise and a little, little dip. So it was basically a compost too that, that ran off. It went down in this little dip and, and sat. And, and that's, the, that's the benefit of compost tea compared to, to nothing. So you can't tell me it doesn't work. And that was just, just discovered by, by accident, I suppose, but it was a great little experiment. And of course, the other thing, they're, they're really hard working Canberra hands, they're, they're Abbott's hands. <laughs> <coughs> so here we, I've actually got him digging and smelling and carrying on there. But that probe beside him, uh, that probe's four and a half feet, so there on me. And you can bury that to the hilt. Um, and that, that's a penetrometer just there. Um, and we're flat to reach 200 PSI. So that's corn stubble that was dug in uh, two, two summers ago. It was actually a corn again this year. So not only have we, have we put the compost on it, but we've, we've managed to get all that stubble in. I call myself probably a min till. I'm, I'm not, not a great fan of zero till. Because of our irrigation system, I like to try and get our stubble in the ground, either by mechanically means, which was, that was dist, or via the cattle. Because I reckon you've got to get the soil bugs out of it to, to, to recycle it. I think sitting it up in the air there, pff, I'm not too sure whether you're not oxidising a lot of it and, and foofing it off. Um, we're trying to become a little less reliant, less reliant on everybody else in the countryside. So uh, we've just put in two 10 kVA solar panels. That's to try and offset some of our irrigation pumping costs during summer. So that should be uh, payback in about five, five and a half years. We actually did get on, just snuck in on um, uh, the previous Premier Keneally's 60 cent job, so that sort of made all that viable. Um, uh, and they're mung beans in the foreground. Um, they're soybeans, that, uh, and that's had two doses of compost over, over a two year period. But just, I don't know whether you can see it from there, but look at that tap root there. He's just gone straight down, and, and you know, he's gone straight down that farm. We've probably broken another, I don't know how much off the bottom of him, and all the nodules that have, that have nodulated right down the roots. So that's, that's just the soil softening up, it, everything's just starting to, starting to crank along again. Uh, a good, good pod set there, and in the background, it, you know, it looks a pretty good colour, doesn't it? So, oh, that's the bride, she, um, she's an ED you now, so she keeps me farming, which is all very kind of her. But that corn behind us, um, there's 300 acres of corn there this year, uh, and I needed one more truckload to average five tonne of the acre, which would have been our best corn crop. Uh, well, it, it still was our best corn crop ever, but um, to get five tonne of the acre was sort of, or that much off it was um, you know, pretty satisfying. So that's about us. Um, there's our operations manager. <laughs> he actually, that's actually above my mailbox as we, as we come into the house. In the last five years, well, well the, whole, the whole, since we've gone on this journey, all the, all the environment has changed. You know, the, we've got a heap of birds and it's just, everything's starting to buzz. Um, the, whole, the whole environment's a whole lot happier. And these guys have come in in the last three to four, five years ago was the first time we saw one. And that was, that was a real sort of buzz for us. But um, they're nearly, nearly resident now. We had some people up from Sydney weekend before last. And here was our mum with the with the Joey on its back, which was pr pretty cool, pretty cool. So um, there we are. So have we got time for a quick question? Oh, actually, I'd just like to thank Rhonda and Bill and congratulate them on achieving ten years, and we'll see you in another hundred. <laughs> Thanks, Cam. <laughs> in another lifetime. Thank you, Cam, so so very much.